Bibles, would invite you to turn with us to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. If not, we trust and pray that you will listen as we read the scripture. Solomon said, For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? And there is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. There is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Paul gives us the explanation of what Solomon says. And we find that answer in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Paul said it's inevitable that there will come an appointed time when we die. And Solomon affirms to us that nobody can change that appointment, nor can they reschedule it. Now, I know death is not a popular subject, but it's one that we must come to face in our own lives. And I want to speak to you on this morning of a very important question, and that is, how will you die? You see, until we're ready to step out into eternity, then we're not able to really live life to its fullness as God had intended for us to do. Heavenly Father, the very nature of the subject is not popular, but I pray that you would give us the anointing power to share this subject. And I pray that each one will listen carefully and will come to the answer and be honest with themselves. When they ask themselves, how will I die? Bless the message and we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Now, let me clarify the question that I've asked. I'm not talking about the state or condition in which you will die. Lacking accident or illness. What I'm asking you is, since it's appointed unto death for men once to die, I'm asking the end of that verse where it says, but after that, the judgment. I want us to notice four things that can answer this particular subject. Number one, some people will die unprepared. Some people will die unprepared. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 22, we have the subject of Lazarus and the rich man. And we find as we read in the text, and it came to pass, and it's coming to pass in that appointed time when we will graduate into eternity. And the story here relates to individuals. Lazarus was carried into the bosom of Abraham, which is a picture of a believer going to heaven. Lazarus had made the necessary commitment to ensure that when he departed, he would be in the presence of God. And that was 
he accepted salvation as God had offered through Jesus Christ. There had been a time in his life when he had come and confessed that he was a sinner, that he was not ready to meet God, but accepting that which God had said, by faith he received the atoning death of Jesus Christ, his personal Savior, which we must do to be assured that to be absent from the body will be present with the Lord. And so Lazarus had made that decision. And the Bible says that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The common fate of all. Though one man had nothing in this life and the other man had more than he could possibly use, the common denominator of all of humanity is that it's appointed once to die, but after that's the judgment. You see, God has affirmed us, ladies and gentlemen, that every knee is going to bow and confess Jesus Christ to the glory of the Father. Lazarus had accepted that gift. It had, he had made that peace that only he can make through Jesus Christ with God the Father. On the other hand, read the rest of the story. The rich man also died. See, there is nothing, there is nothing that can prevent that from coming to pass, as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. It makes no difference who you are, where you are, what you are, how important you are to those that you are involved in. When that appointed time has come to be fulfilled, you will step out into eternity. And it so states here. But notice the difference. Lazarus went to heaven. But the rich man was buried and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Now notice. The rich man died, went to hell. He didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell. Because he ignored God's gift of salvation. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Must be saved. Now Lazarus didn't go to heaven because he was poor. He went to heaven because he accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. On the other hand, the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he refused the gift. And he procrastinated one day too long. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's why we give the invitation that when the gospel is presented to you, to accept it then. It may be given another opportunity, but it could very well be that last opportunity that you will be presented, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the invitation to repent of your sin, accept him by faith, ask him to save you, and you'll be born again. This is the story that we read between Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus took the opportunity when it was presented. He did not delay. He received the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. 
the death, burial, and resurrection that Christ had paid the debt by. He who knew no sin was made sin, that Lazarus might have that righteousness that he needed to stand before the Father. On the other hand, let me say again, the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. He refused what the invitation was given. Look at it again. For he saith, that's the Lord. I have heard thee in a time accepted. And the time that's accepted for salvation is when it's offered. When it's offered. That's when the Holy Spirit has brought to you your need of salvation. And he goes on to say, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Pay attention. Pay attention. Your soul is at stake. What does a man gain if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I personally believe the rich man is a picture of so many people and that he lost his soul because of procrastination. Not accepting that accepted time, that appointed time, and realizing that that day was the day of salvation. Please don't make that mistake. Please don't procrastinate. You know very well under the sound of my voice today whether you've accepted Christ as personal Savior or not. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know so salvation. Or you know where like the rich man you've put it off. You've put it off. You've refused to accept it when it was offered. You'll find yourself in the same predicament, ladies and gentlemen. One day when your day lie, your life is up, you will step out into eternity unsaved. And as the rich man will be buried and in hell, lift up your eyes, being in flames and in torments. Or like Lazarus, that invitation is given. The offer is made, and you will accept God's terms. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by Him. You will gladly receive the gift that God has given, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the payment for sin. And you will confess that you are a sinner, ask God to forgive you, and Christ to save you. And when, like Lazarus, your time comes to be absent from the body, will be present with the Lord. Let me remind you, what if you gained? If you gained the whole world, but lose your own soul. So let me encourage you. Let me beseech you. Let me plead with you. Come to Christ today if you've not. Right now. Right now. God has offered you the opportunity from the gospel message of today to know that you're a sinner, that Christ is the only hope, and that if you'll receive him, you can have the assurance of salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do that right now, my friend. If you're listening to us while you're in a automobile or anything of that nature later on, stop. Stop whatever you're doing. Be safe, but accept Christ as personal Savior. Number two, some Christians will die in shame 
as Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, did. We look at Acts chapter 5, 1 through 5. But a certain man named sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, I want you to listen to this believer. Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost or to keep back part of the price of the land? While it's remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why? Hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. A great fear came upon all them that heard of these things. And Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, died in shame. Now they were saved. They could not lose their soul. They both went to heaven. But. They forgot. The covenant they had made with God in salvation. And the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Which are God's. They represent the believer whose commitment to Christ is all vocal, but it's not lived out. They speak a good testimony, but they have a life that is contrary to that testimony. And Paul warns, when we accept Christ, ladies and gentlemen, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 tells us very, very carefully, when we make a commitment to the Lord, it is irreversible. It is irreversible. Do not try to excuse yourself for undoing the commitment that you made as a Christian. And seek to return back to your own life choice or life walk. Paul tells us very plainly. He warns us of disobeying that commitment that we make in serving Christ. Now Ananias and Sapphira, that was their property. They caught up in the emotional to be recognized as part of those that were making a commitment. And let me say to you, ladies and gentlemen, they were in it for the show. They were in it under false pretenses. They did not have to make that commitment, but once they made it, then they didn't realize how much was involved, pride and greed took over. And they sought to lie. And remember who they lied to? You see, you're not lying to the preacher. You're not lying to the church. Your commitments are made to God. And when they're failed to be followed through with, the Bible tells us very plainly, he said, Notice that. He said, Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And as a result of it, notice, in Romans 6, 16. Know ye not? Now that's a little bit of 
sarcasm from Paul. We might say, are you kidding? Did you not understand what was taking place? <laughs> what? Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, the servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether unto life, whether unto sin, unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. You see, to attempt to live such a life of non-commitment is to shame the cause of Christ. Because the Bible said, and you shall know them by their fruits. And the commission of the believer is to let our light shine. That men might see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And it's dangerous to be what I call a counterfeit believer. And that's to be projecting a commitment for show without any substance and proof that's being lived out. Therefore, there'll be a lot of folks that are saved are going to be ashamed when they stand before Jesus because their life was a lie, a waste. God doesn't force you to make a commitment to Him. But if you make that commitment, He requires us to follow through with it. Perhaps your life right now is in shambles or going through a test that keeps on and on. Pause for just a moment and check your commitment. Has it been with mouth or has it been with heart? With mouth, it will change according to circumstance. With the heart, it will be like the Apostle Paul. The Bible said you see some Christians. Will die as Paul did. Faithful unto death. Faithful unto death. He made a commitment there on the Damascus road. And he died in that same commitment. 1 Timothy 4. 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. It was time for his commitment to be fulfilled. And his time expired. And he was going to step out into eternity. But look what he said. Look what he said. And this should be the goal of every believer. Regardless of who or what you are as far in ministry. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I didn't waver in and out, on and off. I made that commitment. And I brought my body into subjection, lest by any means after I had preached to others, I became a reprobate. Look at it. Oh, listen to me. There is that unique, that unique reward for those who have begun the journey to finish the journey and not step out and fall by the wayside as Ananias and Sapphira did. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to whosoever, but unto all them also that love is appearing. 
Notice, this is the testimony that we should have before we have to stand before the Lord. For now I'm ready to be offered. No undone business. No undone business with the Lord. I fought a good fight. I've been faithful to the end. You see, Paul had finished what God had sent him to do. Therefore, he died as he lived unashamed. Now, in closing, dear friend, I understand that death is not a proper subject. But God in his mercy and grace has brought to attention. It's appointed to each of us to die. The question is this morning, will you die unprepared as the rich man? Or will you die prepared as Lazarus? The second question, will you die ashamed as Ananias and Sapphira did? Because you lived a hypocritical life? may be unknown to anyone, but it's not unknown to God. Far too many is going to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I just wasted that new life that you gave me. I tried to live on Sunday for you, Monday through Saturday for me, and I wasted my life. Or can you say, when you stand before the Lord, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. And therefore you can be assured if you have as Paul, you can affirm the entrance you'll have in heaven. Peter states it in closing. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 and 11. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, what, what a joy it will be to have Jesus meet you at the entrance into heaven and be able to say to you or me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Heavenly Father, Father of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God, the only God, help us to understand, help us to see as we have this appointment, let it not be foolish like the rich man. Let it be assured like Lazarus, for we know in whom we have believed that he's able to keep that. Let it not be like Ananias and Sapphira in shame and a wasted, hypocritical life. Let it be as the Apostle Paul, we kept the faith, we fought a good fight, and as Peter assures us, let us be able to claim that as we enter into the presence of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, bless the message in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you today. And may you accept Christ. And may that commitment you make be real until the day you stand before Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.